Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, achieving human level qualitative reasoning with a natural language of thought. So I'll discuss uh, several topics. Uh, what is human level intelligence? What would be human level AI? What are the major options to achieve human level AI and uh, for understanding natural language? And then what is human level qualitative reasoning? And uh, I'll go over all these topics. Uh, I'll be re uh, repeating some of the slides that I gave in my keynote uh, talk yesterday, but that's sort of unavoidable uh, for this topic. Okay, so what is human level intelligence? Just defining this concept has been a challenge uh, for AI researchers. Uh, some people have suggested that it may not be a coherent concept, uh, even though we can recognize it uh, when we see it in other people. A Turing test uh, could help recognize human level AI if it's created, uh, but the test uh, doesn't define intelligence. It doesn't tell us how to design and build a human level uh, AI system. And also a Turing test uh, focuses on uh, recognizing human identical AI, but it could be uh, sufficient and uh, important to develop systems that are human-like and understandable uh, but not necessarily human identical. So in my 2014 thesis, I proposed a different approach, which is that we define human level intelligence by identifying abilities that are achieved by humans and not yet achieved by any AI system. And I chose the abilities that I identified as, I chose to call them higher level mentalities. And so they include uh, fully general purpose, natural language understanding at the level that humans achieve, uh, self-development and higher level learning. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, metacognition, imagination, artificial consciousness, sociality, visualization, curiosity, and creativity. And all of these with the same uh, generality and effectiveness and efficiency uh, that humans achieve. And this is just my short list. There are you know, others that people may propose or could be identified. Okay, so what are the major options to achieve human level AI? Uh, logically, there are sort of three major alternatives. Uh, purely symbolic approaches, uh, neural network architectures, and hybrid systems. Uh, you could argue that theoretically, either the symbolic approaches or the neural network architectures could each be successful uh, because they have computational generality. But hybrid systems could have some advantages. Uh, symbolic processing and neural networks could augment each other. Um, so I advocate a class of hybrid architectures that I call the Talamite architecture, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later in this talk. Okay, uh, well, the major options for AI understanding natural language parallel those for achieving human level AI. Um, and again, there are theoretical arguments that you could do it uh, entirely with symbolic or entirely with neural networks, um, but there are reasons in favor of hybrid systems. And if we're gonna build uh, a hybrid system, which I think is probably the best way to go, then uh, we need to at least look at the symbolic methods and, and realize that there are two major alternatives uh, for symbolic processing. One is to treat natural language as external data and to translate natural language to and from uh, some simpler internal symbolic language. And that could be uh, predicate calculus or conceptual graphs or n-tuples of data. Uh, this general approach has been the traditional AI approach for natural language uh, for several decades. But there's another approach, which is to use natural language as a language of thought uh, within an AI system. And in this approach, um, there would be internal data structures that represent the uh, syntax and semantics of natural language expressions. And inference and conceptual processing would be performed with these natural language data structures. And um, there could be other symbolic languages in the system that support this, like support pattern matching or interpretation but in this approach, the data structures that represent the natural language expressions would be the general high-level representation of thoughts uh, within the AI system. 
Now, there's not a scientific consensus that this approach uh, cannot work. It's just been an assumption for decades that symbolic AI systems should only use formal logic languages or simpler uh, symbolic languages uh, for internal representation. But there does not appear to be any theoretical reason uh, why a natural language like English could not be used directly uh, by an AI system for its language of thought. And this approach could be combined with neural networks in a hybrid approach. Okay, so what is human level qualitative reasoning? Uh, Ken Forbes in his 2018 book gave a broad survey of qualitative reasoning. And he made it very clear that qualitative reasoning and qualitative concepts are very important in many aspects of human intelligence. So we could, at least as a starting point, define human level qualitative reasoning as all the forms of qualitative reasoning that are used in the higher level mentalities of human level intelligence. This definition only gives us a starting point to talk about the topic. And I'll give some initial uh, discussion in this presentation about uh, how qualitative reasoning can support a few of the higher level mentalities. So self-development and higher level learning. I use the term higher level learning to talk about um, learning um, in various kinds. Uh, learning that involves uh, induction of new linguistic concepts, learning by creating explanations and testing predictions, uh, causal and purposive reasoning, uh, learning about new domains by developing analogies and metaphors of previous domains, uh, learning that involves reflection and self-programming, uh, reasoning about thoughts and experience to develop new ways of thinking and acting, learning that involves invention of new languages and representations. Now these things have uh, each of them been considered a little bit at least in some previous research over the decades, although most research is focused on lower level forms of learning, uh, such as neural, neural network architectures and so on. Uh, but it seems very clear that qualitative uh, representations and reasoning would be important supporting at least the italicized uh, forms of higher level learning that I've uh, in the above, list above uh, in a system that uses a natural language of thought. Uh, so, for example, learning about new domains by developing analogies and metaphors with previous domains, I've italicized that because it seems clear qualitative reasoning could be important in uh, developing analogies and metaphors uh, uh, relating domains. Metacognition is cognition about cognition, applying cognitive processes to cognitive processes. We, there are several different forms we can consider, for example, reasoning about reasoning, reasoning about learning, learning how to learn. Uh, many people have focused on other aspects like knowing about knowing or knowing about memory. And you could also have uh, longer combinations, imagining how to learn about perception. And you could instantiate that to refer to a specific perception. A natural language of thought could help an AI system perform metacognition uh, by enabling the inner speech expression of uh, specific thoughts about other specific thoughts or specific thoughts about uh, specific perceptions and so on. And using qualitative words and expressions, um, a natural language of thought could support qualitative reasoning and metacognition. Sociality, uh, well, a human level AI is gonna need some level of social understanding to interact with humans. It will need some understanding of uh, cultural conventions, some understanding of human emotions that people feel. It may even need to have some emotions of its own, though we need to be careful about that. Uh, within an AI system, the emotions can help guide choices of goals and prioritization of goals. And apart from whether and how emotions might be represented internally, an AI system is also gonna need to understand how people express emotions in behaviors and linguistically, and how its behaviors and linguistic expressions can affect people and their emotions. So again, by supporting qualitative words and expressions, a natural language of thought can play an important role in supporting sociality in understanding and expression of emotions. Okay, now for uh, more general uh, comments about natural language understanding and qualitative reasoning. 
Um, qualitative reasoning is essential to natural language understanding. And natural language is the main vehicle that people use to express qualitative reasoning. So there's a sort of strong duality between the two, uh, two notions, two terms. If you open a, a newspaper, you can easily find sentences like this example. Uh, where individual investors are holding more stocks as major indexes climb to fresh highs, magnifying their bets, increasingly buying on small debt dips. So um, frequently we see qualitative verbs and known, uh, nouns and adjectives in uh, uh, discussions even of quantitative matters like stocks. Natural language expressions can group these into larger constructs that still retain the qualitative uh, nature. So to understand natural language as it's normally used, a human level AI has to be able to understand qualitative expressions and qualitative reasoning. And likewise, a natural language of thought that includes qualitative expressions internally uh, could help support qualitative reasoning uh, within a human level AI. Okay, now some words about the, the Talamind approach that I advocate for achieving human level AI. It has three uh, hypotheses. The first is that intelligent systems can be designed as intelligence kernels, uh, systems of initial concepts that can create and modify concepts and extend themselves to behave intelligently in an environment. And this is basically a, my statement of what is called uh, the seed AI approach. So this is the idea of a system that uh, you give it, you, you start with this initial intelligence kernel, you place it in an environment where it can interact with the environment and that may include uh, human beings and other intelligent systems and so on. And it can then learn in that environment and grow and extend itself. Uh, the next uh, hypothesis that is that a natural language of thought can support an intelligence kernel uh, in achieving uh, human level intelligence and uh, in effect support inner speech and self-talk. And the third uh, hypothesis is that methods for cognitive linguistics uh, can be important in multiple levels of mental representation. Uh, for example, constructions and mental spaces and conceptual lens. And so all of these are discussed in my thesis and uh, the Talmind approach advocates a three level architecture for achieving human level AI. And that's shown on this slide here. Uh, at the top level, we have the linguistic level, linguistic concept structures, um, the conceptual processes that work with the linguistic uh, expressions and the conceptual framework. Uh, and in the middle level, we have the archetype level for representation of cognitive categories. And there's a variety of different methods that uh, could, be, could be relevant. Um, and then the lowest level is the associative level uh, for connections and neural networks. And um, so that's the basic architecture. So at the linguistic level, we'd have the natural language of thought, which I call Tala, with the unconstrained syntax and semantics of English. We'd support re reasoning directly with that syntax within the intelligence kernel. In a principle, we could support other natural language, languages besides English. So there is a, a thesis prototype system that illustrates the linguistic level of processing uh, with, with a lot of limitations, but it does illustrate that it's described in my thesis. And for concision, I call it a system that has this Talamite architecture, a Tala agent. Okay, how could this support qualitative reasoning with the natural language of thought? Uh, the architecture would use the natural language of thought at its linguistic level. Uh, the system would support qualitative reasoning by creating and processing sentences that include qualitative expressions in the natural language of thought. And then the archetype level is envisioned to support semantic frames. And this could support representation of qualitative concepts with semantic frames. And Forbes in his book uh, discussed how frame-based qualitative process representations could support understanding of semantics for natural language expressions. So those are the basic ingredients uh, that in theory could allow uh, qualitative reasoning uh, within a Talamind architecture. 
uh, one of the paper's reviewers asked uh, if natural language is the symbolic representation, then what does that mean? Uh, and what does it mean to do symbolic reasoning? Well, in the Talaline approach, symbolic reasoning is what it was before formal logic was developed. Symbolic reasoning is using natural language expressions to derive other natural language expressions. So if we have all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, we can derive Socrates as mortal. But this is performed without translation of the expressions into predicate calculus or conceptual graphs or some other logical notation. Of course, this is a simple example. And the true power of reasoning of natural language is our ability to represent and reason with uh, thoughts that are not easy to represent in formal logic. And so there's a lot of discussion in my thesis about, about that topic. Um, the reviewer also asked uh, whether Talamai's use of a natural language of thought, uh, quote, is essentially an embodiment of the strong version of linguistic relativity, that thought, that language determines thought, unquote. But I'd say that Talamai is only constrained by a, a weak version of linguistic relativity. Uh, the Intelligence kernel should have a set of initial concepts and executable concepts that would enable the system to learn and invent new languages. So the system would not be limited to a single natural language of thought. And if you understand what I mean, you could understand also other natural languages. And the system's associative level would support learning concepts uh, that are not limited by its language of thoughts. Um, and concepts learned by neural networks may not be easy to define very well in natural language. This is a characteristic of human intelligence. We, we can recognize some things that we're not easily able to define in natural language. And we can think of that as a feature. It's not a, not a bug, it's not a limitation. So in summary, uh, a natural language of thought would be ideal for support of qualitative reasoning um, in a system that could eventually achieve human level artificial intelligence. And there's much more work that needs to be done to achieve this. And I just, the goal of this paper is just to motivate future, uh, future work in this direction. Uh, these are some of the references and in particular, I focused people on uh, my 2019 book. Um, and then uh, some of these papers here that are listed. Um, if you go to www.talamine.com, the publications page uh, has pointers to uh, these things. And that basically concludes my talk. I'd be glad to try and answer some questions. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, just perfect timing. Okay, Roman. We cannot hear you. Please turn on your mic. Hello? Yes. Hello? Oh, okay. Thank you, Phil. Very uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, theme. Uh, how do you think? Uh, uh, what if metacognition uh, is made uh, as a uh, some kind of sensor which is introduced into uh, our, I think, uh, brain or mind or something like that, like other sensors uh, which we see. Uh, like eyes, ears, and other. Uh, what if uh, some kind of sensor looks into uh, our inner processes of mind? Uh, how could it be? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question um, exactly. Uh, can you can you restate it somehow? Uh, okay. Uh, my idea is uh, that metacognition uh, is uh, the same process of uh, uh, the same process of perception, like uh, uh, viewing something or hearing something. And uh, uh, we uh, human beings uh, have some, uh, some sensory systems in, uh, introduced in our mind, in our brain as a medium, uh, which are uh, perceiving uh these inner processes uh this is only idea not uh just hypothesis uh, but uh how do we feel uh if it can be uh operative idea and uh 
perhaps we can use it uh, to make metacognition processes into AGI agents. Okay, I, I think of metacognition a little bit differently, I guess. Um, I'd sort of treat it as thinking about thinking, uh, yes. cognition about cognition. Um, and uh, one way to, to uh, think about it is in terms of uh, inner speech. There were some good presentations yesterday uh, by other uh, speakers about inner speech, this idea that um, we can hear mentally, we can sort of hear our own thoughts inside our head, uh, heads uh, expressed uh, as natural language thoughts, as inner speech or self-talk. And people have that in, in their own ordinary, uh, in their own natural languages. And then we can think about the thoughts that we hear in our, in our, in our head and maybe produce more thoughts. And that's one form of metacognition is the ability to, to uh, have inner th speech thoughts about our inner speech thoughts or, or about our perceptions or whatever. We look at something and say, oh, that's strange. And what is that or whatever? So there's various kinds of metacognition that can occur. And um, so that, that's the way that I, that I would uh, represent metacognition within an AI system. It would also have uh, thoughts developed uh, within its, um, um, I'll show some extra slides here. This is uh, an excerpt from the uh, demonstration of, uh, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's the demonstration of uh, the prototype system that simulates uh, what I call the discovery of bread scenario. And so it's displayed as natural language sentences and the sentences describe an interaction between two agents um, that are discovering how to make bread. One of them is a uh, person that can grow, grow grain. Another person is a person who can, can, uh, can cook things. And so they talk to each other and they also think and we see their thoughts being expressed in this uh, transcript. And they're thinking about things, um, uh, going through the process of discovering how to make bread. And then I've highlighted in bold font uh, uh, the various uh, qualitative words that were involved in, in the uh, simulation. Now, all of this is, is hard coded in my prototype demonstration, although the system does use uh, uh, inefficient pattern matching to support uh, each of these conceptual steps being generated. Uh, so it, it, it illustrates a lot of different machinery, although it's not a robust simulation, but it illustrates how, the, in general, how the system could work. And then the bold font uh, illus illustrates words that are qualitative. So uh, the importance of qualitative concepts is uh, illustrated by that. So anyway, you can see there are sentences like, uh, ben thinks wheat grains resemble nuts. Uh, ben imagines an analogy from nuts to grain. Nuts are like grain, basically. Ben thinks that grain perhaps is an edible seed. These are just different thoughts that Ben has in his head, in his language of thought, and that get produced as Ben figures out uh, how to, uh, first of all, make uh, flat bread, and then later on, how to, to make uh, uh, bread by baking dough and making it thick and edible and so on. So that's, that's just sort of um, how the prototype illustrates uh, the language of thought concept. Bill, I want, this is Sam Adams. I, I'd like to get your comment on um, the psych work because, you know, one of the problems of, of, a, of, a, of a hard coded demonstration is there's so much of your own semantics in your own mind that get coded in. You, we really can't keep ourselves from doing it. It's really hard. And the guys at Psych spent a quarter of a century and who knows how many million dollars trying to suss out kind of all the base kind of rules and ontologies. And they, they didn't really succeed very strongly. So what are your thoughts? How are you going to overcome that? That's a good, tough question. Um, the, um, it goes back to the intelligence kernel question. Okay, how do you build an intelligence kernel? And um, um, I wrote a, uh, my master's thesis back in 1979 on the intelligence kernel idea. Um, I had 
Um, and at that time, it was just considered uh, too outlandish uh, and nobody could understand it. And, um, but basically I described, I took um, the approach that Doug Linnett had developed uh, for creating uh, AM and discovering mathematical concepts. Mm -hmm. And I translated that into a more general form uh, for a system that could uh, discover concepts in any field and described how this kind of a system could be an intelligence kernel. And the idea being that you could then you could start this, you could put it in place in an environment, and give it uh, sensors and the ability to get information from the environment. And it could then extend its knowledge about the environment, develop concepts and learn to understand its environment. So that's what I described back then, but it was co considered too uh, outlandish and far-fetched and uh, not, uh, people didn't really understand it. So it sort of, that was the state of them. It became a master's thesis instead of a doctorate. Right. And, um, but that's basically what I would still do, except that now I would, would make the whole thing use natural, a natural language of thought. Um, so that, that's where I'm at right now in terms of making. I think, I think it, it can be done. I don't think it's easy, but I also don't think it's going to take 100 years. I think it's something that could probably be done in 10, uh, 10 years or so, uh, potentially 20. I don't know. Maybe that's an underestimate. We'll see. I, I'm just smiling because we always ask that question of each other at some point, how long, and it's always 10 years or 20 years. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it could be done faster, but... And I, I don't know. It's I. Uh, it's not. It's not you, Phil. It's 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 all of us. I, I think every time right. we're asked that question, we always give the same answer. <laughs> that's right. But there are some people like John Soa. He's written. He doesn't think human level oh, yeah. AI will happen within the next hundred years. I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm much a great more optimistic. Fan of I think. It can be done. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? I think when speaking about natural language understanding, it's useful to have a definition of what understanding is, because it is very often confused with just transforming data, often mechanical, into some other representation. What is definition? What is really understanding, and what is simply representation in another format? So that's a very a good question for understanding. That's a very good question. Um, I have a paper on, it's called Understanding Understanding. That's the, the start of the title. And if you uh, go to my website uh, in the publications page, you'll find a link to that paper. Um, I agree that just understanding what understanding is, is, is uh, not easy, but I think Again, I propose my own answer, uh, my own description of what it is. Did you consider Benjamin Bloom's definition of comprehension or understanding? It's, he puts a made user of knowledge as the definition of understanding. Not just transform, but make user of the knowledge that is expressed in the text. Okay, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the question or, or a statement. What did you think about Bloom's definition of understanding? Uh, a particular definition of understanding? Uh, or... Bloom defined understanding as being able to make use of the knowledge, not just storing it, but make use in some situation. Well, that, that's one aspect of understanding. Um, and um, I wouldn't say that's the, the only uh, uh, form of understanding. Um, there's a variety of different forms that are, are discussed in my paper. Um, and um, a, a similar question is what is knowledge, okay? Um, and that's uh, I had a, a paper that I gave a presentation on yesterday. Uh, uh, what is knowledge? And my t my definition for knowledge is um, knowledge is information 
that enables intelligence. And human level knowledge is information that enables human level intelligence. And the, the thing that I would say about that is that it starts with the concept of information. We know that can be defined at least in, in information theory. We have a definition of that. Um, but it leaves open the issue of how uh, information can uh, in, enable intelligence. Um, and uh, that depends on, on the extent to which uh, it can be used by intelligence. And uh, it, um, but at least that's a starting point for it. Different forms of knowledge uh, can enable intelligence in different ways. And also it's, it's not a static thing. Uh, um, uh, we may have one form of knowledge at one point in time, and then later on it gets uh, replaced by a different form of knowledge. We used to know that uh, the sun orbits the earth. And now we know that the earth orbits the sun. So um, we successively change and refine and improve our knowledge. Okay, Artemi. Uh, do we have time left? Please go uh, ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I should say that every natural language has different sources of ambiguity, like lexical ambiguity, syntactic ambiguity, uh, reference ambiguity, and so on. So if we use natural language as a language of thought, how to deal with ambiguity in these models? That's a very good question. Um, the, um, and again, that was discussed um, in my, uh, my talk. The, um, I don't know if I can bring up the other slide for it or not, but it, uh, the basic answer is that it's, it's not a problem, okay? Ambiguity, um, there are, there's research on what's called relevance theory that uh, studies how you can efficiently uh, disambiguate uh, language uh, or uh, natural language um, in, a, in a given situation to find out what is uh, intended uh, to resolve ambiguity. So relevance theory provides a, uh, an approach to efficient disambiguation. And then the second thing to, to recognize, there are a couple other things. First of all, ambiguity it is, can have virtues, okay? Ambiguity in natural languages allows us to talk about anything without having to be specific about everything, okay? It's, it's, a, it's actually, a, it's a virtue of natural language that we don't have to be specific about everything. And uh, the second thing is that um, just because we're using natural language, it's not like we're increasing the ambiguity problem. Um, if you try to use formal languages, uh, they are formal logic is also inherently amb ambiguous. It makes use of undefined terms that only have meaning inside the formal theory. So you still have the ambiguity problem, you're matching a formal theory to the, to the outside world. Um, and uh, formal theories are very limited. So I don't see ambiguity as a showstopper. I, I see it as something that can actually be a good thing and also something that uh, we have ways of dealing with efficiently. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, we exhausted uh, the time. And thank you very much, Phil, for the interesting talk. Okay, now, thank you. Now we shall proceed with the next talk by uh, Roman Dushkin. <laughs>